polyps of the large intestine are near plastic or non near plastic. The non near plastic ones are due to mucosal epithelial proliferation or regeneration without dysplasia. The near plastic ones are adenomatous polyps caused by epithelial proliferation with dysplasia. Non near plastic polyps include hyperplastic or metaplastic polyps, hamartomatous polyps such as Pertz Jaegers, juvenile and retention polyps inflammatory polyps or pseudopolyps, and lymphoid polyps. These little warty blebs that you can see on the colonic surface are hyperplastic or metaplastic polyps. To the left of the field we can see normal colonic mucosa, but to the right coming into view is part of a hyperplastic polyp with its serrated surface. And here we can see a juvenile polyp, which is a type of hamartomatous polyp. Here we can see a colon from a patient with long-standing ulcerative colitis. This has resulted in these pseudopolyps that you can see as we move along the colon, caused by regeneration of the damaged mucosa. And this is what a pseudopolyp looks like down the microscope. All adenomatous polyps are dysplastic. The dysplasia may be low or high grade, and adenomatous polyps are therefore potentially precancerous. The risk of cancer increases with the number of adenomatous polyps present. Adenomatous polyps are either tubular adenomas, tubulovillous adenomas, or villous adenomas. Over 90% of adenomatous polyps are tubular adenomas. They tend to be small and pedunculated, and cancer is rare in polyps less than 1 cm in diameter. This is the gross appearance of a typical tubular adenoma. And here you can see a low power view of a tubular adenoma down a microscope. In this tubular adenoma, as we scan to the right of the picture, you can see an adenocarcinoma coming into view that has arisen in the adenoma. 5 to 10% of adenomatous polyps are tubulovillous adenomas. In these, 25 to 50 percent of the polyp is villus, and cancer tends to arise in the villus component. And this is what a typical tubulovillus adenoma looks like down the microscope. Approximately 1 percent of adenomatous polyps are villus adenomas. They are most common in the rectum and distal colon. They are larger than tubular adenomas, up to 10 centimeters in diameter, and there is a high risk of cancer in villus adenomas greater than 4 centimeters in diameter. Here you can see what a typical villus adenoma looks like. Predisposing factors for cancer of the large intestine are sporadic, familial adenomatous polyposis, hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer syndrome, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Sporadic carcinoma of the large intestine shares a similar geographic frequency and anatomical location as adenomatous polyps. They are common in the developed countries but uncommon in Africa and South America. They occur most frequently between the ages of 60 and 80 associated with low fibre diet, obesity and inactivity. The pale lesions protruding from the colonic mucosa in this picture are adenomatous polyps. As we move through the field you can see an ulcerating lesion and this is the typical appearance of a carcinoma of the colon. Incidentally the background of the colon is black due to melanosis coli. This is the histological appearance of an adenocarcinoma of the colon. You can see the malignant glands infiltrating through the thick muscle coat known as the muscularis propria. 
Familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP, is rare. Its inheritance is autosomal dominant. There are hundreds or thousands of adenomatous polyps in the large intestine, and cancer occurs at a young age, typically before 30 to 40 years. Frequent colonoscopy and eventual colectomy is required to prevent cancer in these patients. This is the typical appearance of a colon affected by familial adenomatous polyposis coli. You can see multiple polyps affecting the majority of the mucosa. And here is another colon with familial polyposis coli, but in the centre of the picture, as we zoom in, you can see that an adenocarcinoma has developed. Hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer syndrome is much more common than FAP. 90% of patients develop cancer, and that is 1-5% to of the population. The inheritance is autosomal dominant. There's an increased instance of carcinoma of ovary, endometrium and stomach. Cancer occurs at a young age, and the tumours tend to be aggressive and poorly differentiated. In ulcerative colitis, there is a high instance of cancer in patients with a history of pancolitis for 10 years or more. They have 20 to 30 times the risk of cancer compared to the normal population. The cancers are often infiltrative and not exophytic, and the symptoms of cancer may be masked by those of ulcerative colitis. In these patients, frequent surveillance by colonoscopy is required with biopsies to assess for dysplasia. This is a colon from a patient with ulcerative colitis showing features of villus dysplasia. This is the biopsy from a patient with long-standing history of ulcerative colitis. The gland crypts at the bottom of the field are fairly unremarkable, but towards the top of the field the gland crypts have become dysplastic and it is in areas like this that carcinomas may develop. The prognosis of colorectal carcinoma depends on the stage of tumour spread, the circumferential clearance of tumour, particularly in rectal carcinomas, and the degree of differentiation. Here is a colonic carcinoma that has infiltrated through the full thickness of the bowel wall. The nodule at the bottom of the picture is a lymph node containing metastatic adenocarcinoma. This is a very advanced colonic carcinoma that has infiltrated into the stomach wall, resulting in a gastrocolic fistula. Whistling while you pee is not always a sign of inner contentment. Occasionally it may be a symptom of advanced colonic cancer. This is a colon with a carcinoma that has infiltrated into the bladder wall. This produces a fistula, causing the symptom of pneumaturia when gas from the colon gains access to the lumen of the bladder. Other cancers of the large intestine include carcinoid tumours, lymphoma, gastrointestinal stromal tumours or GISTs, and also, of course, metastases. The submucosa of this biopsy from sigmoid colon contains a deposit of ovarian carcinoma. Around 50% of carcinomas of the large intestine are present in the rectum and sigmoid colon, 30% in the descending and transverse colon, and 20% in the right colon and cecum. A significant proportion of tumours can therefore be seen with the sigmoidoscope and a smaller proportion detected digitally. Well, as they always say, if you don't put your finger in it, you put your foot in it.